Hi, and welcome again to my series of videos for General Chemistry 2. In the last video, we started talking about the rates of chemical reactions. It's an important topic because lots of practical inventions, from the fuels that power our cars and rockets to the batteries we need for all our electronic devices, depend on the speeds of chemical reactions they use. Today, I want to tell you about one common way of determining the rate of a chemical reaction. It's a much more reliable method than we learned about in the previous video, and it's the one that you'll use in your chemistry lab course soon. In the last video, we saw this equation. It's the general formula for determining the rate of a reaction. We divide the change in the concentration of a reactant or product by the time that elapses during the experiment. We then divide by the coefficient of the compound that appears in the balanced reaction. But as we saw in the last video, this gives us the average velocity, and that can change depending on the concentration of the compounds at the time we begin the experiment. So in order to understand how fast a reaction is, we really need to understand the connection between the rate and the concentration at the beginning of our experiment. Fortunately, there is a way to do that. We do it using what's called a rate law, and today I want to tell you about what a rate law is and how you use it. It's one of the most important topics in this chapter because we can use rate laws to get all kinds of information about chemical reactions, as we'll see in the next few videos. To determine the rate law for a reaction, we have to perform experiments. For example, suppose we had a generic reaction like this. We have three different reactants, A, B, and C, and we form a product called D. We'll perform several trials of this experiment. For each trial, we need to know the concentrations we start with for each reactant. For the first trial, suppose we start with a concentration of 0 0.0100 molar for reactant A, 0 0.0200 molar for B, and 0 0.0100 molar for C. We also need to know the rate. If you remember, this equation tells us that we need to measure the change in the concentration of one of the reactants or products and the amount of time it takes for the change. We also need to divide by the coefficient from the balanced reaction. It doesn't matter which reactant or product we choose to measure, since each of the possibilities should give us the same result. So, suppose we measure delta concentration and delta t in order to calculate the rate for this trial, and we get a rate of 2.00 times 10 to the minus 3 molars per second. What can we do with this information? Remember, what we're trying to do is learn how the concentrations of the reactants affect the rate of the reaction. So, what we need to do next is perform a second trial, but this time we'll change the concentrations and see what happens to the rate. But we don't want to change all three of the concentrations. If we do that, we won't be able to tell what effect each of the three changes had on the rate. Instead, we'll only change one of the concentrations, and we'll leave the other two alone. So, let's just change the concentration of reactant A. We'll double it to 0 0.0200 molar. B and C will stay the same as in trial 1. When we perform experiments where we change some variables and keep other variables constant, the ones that we don't change are called controls. So in this case, the concentrations of B and C are control variables. Anyway, suppose we perform this second trial and we find out that the rate this time is 8.00 times 10 to the minus 3 molars per second. This time we got some really useful information from our experiment. Notice what happened. We doubled the concentration of A, and as a result, the rate went up by a factor of 4. How can we use that information? It turns out that the rate of a chemical reaction always has what's called an exponential dependence on the starting concentration of each reactant. In other words, the rate is always proportional to the concentration raised to some power. We can write this using this equation. This symbol means proportional to. Here's why this is important. Think about this equation. 3.375 is equal to 1.5 raised to the third power. Pretty simple, right? Now, suppose we double this number. Now we have 3 to the third power, which is 27. 
But now suppose we had those equations, but didn't know what the power was. Instead, it's our job to figure out the exponent based on the information that we've got. That could be a tricky problem to solve, but here's an easy way to do it. We look at the ratio between these two numbers and between these two. In this case, the ratio between 27 and 3.375 is 8. Meanwhile, the ratio between 3 and 1.5 is 2. So now we have this equation, and we need to find the exponent. We have 8 equals 2 raised to an exponent. Hopefully you know how exponents work. If you do, you can see that the exponent here is 3. So now let's go back to our experiment. I told you that the rate is proportional to the concentration raised to an exponent. We have two trials, so we can write two equations, one for the first trial and one for the second. Just like we did in the example we looked at a minute ago, we want to take the ratio between these two numbers and between these two. When we divide the two rates, we get 4. And when we divide the two concentrations, we get 2. That makes our exponent 2. So the reactant A has an exponent of 2. Our job is to find the exponent for each of the reactants. So we'll find the exponent for B and C next. Before we do that, notice that when I took the ratios, I divided the second trial by the first trial. We didn't have to do it in that order. We could have divided the first by the second instead, and we'd still get the same answer. Let's try that. If we divide rate 1 by rate 2, we get 1 quarter, or 0 0.25. If we divide the two concentrations, we get 1 half, or 0.5. In order to make this equation work out, our exponent must be 2. That's exactly what we got when we divided the trials in the other order. So it doesn't matter which trial you use as the numerator and which as the denominator. I personally like to divide the larger numbers by the smaller ones, the way we did it the first time, but feel free to do it either way. The only thing that matters is that whichever trial you use for the numerator when you take the ratio of the rates, you must use the same trial for the numerator when you take the ratio of the concentrations. Anyway, we now know that the exponent for reactant A is 2. Next, let's find the exponents for B and C. To do that, we need to do a third trial. This time, our initial concentrations are 0 0.0100 molar, 0 0.0400 molar, and 0 0.0100 molar for A, B, and C. When we measure the rate, we find out that it's 4.00 times 10 to the minus 3 molars per second. Once again, we need to look at the ratio between the rates and between the concentrations. But we need to be a little careful. We don't want to compare this trial with the previous one. Why not? Well, look carefully at the concentrations. If you compare trials 2 and 3, you'll notice that two of the concentrations change. That's not good. We need to control all but one of our concentrations. So instead, let's compare trial 3 to the first trial. When we do that, we can see that the concentrations of A and C are the same, so those are our controls, and the concentration of B is the variable. So just like before, we'll take the ratio of the two rates and of the concentrations of B. When we do, we find that the rates have a ratio of 2, and the concentrations also have a ratio of 2. That makes our exponent equal to 1. So, now we know the exponents for reactants A and B. We need to take one more trial so that we can find the exponent of reactant C. So here's the data. Again, we need two of the concentrations to be constant. If you compare trial 4 to trial 3, you'll notice that the concentrations of A and B are the same, so those are the controls. If we take the ratio of the rates, we get 1 and the ratio of the concentrations is 2. That means the exponent this time is 0. In case you didn't know that, it turns out that any number raised to the power of 0 is equal to 1. So, now our job is almost done. 
we now know the exponent for each of the reactants. That tells us how the concentration of each reactant affects the rate of the reaction. In this example, we now know that the exponent for reactant A is 2. That means we know what will happen to the rate when we change the concentration of A. For example, if we increase the concentration by a factor of 5, the rate will go up by 5 squared. So the rate will be 25 times higher. We can put all this information into one big equation. We multiply together all the different reactants and their exponents. The only problem left is that we still have this proportionality symbol in our equation. We can make this an equal sign if we place a constant on the right side of the equal sign. We usually use the symbol k for this constant, and that finally gives us this equation. This is called a rate law. It's an equation that ties together all the important information that we've looked at so far. It tells us how the rate changes depending on the concentrations of the reactants. Every chemical reaction has its own rate law, and its own value for k, which is called the rate law constant. The rate law is a crucial piece of information about a chemical reaction, so we'll spend a fair amount of time talking about it. One important thing to know is that, in order to determine the rate law, we need data, like the data we had for this reaction. It's not possible to figure out the exponents on a reaction just by looking at the balanced equation. Rate laws are always set up the same way. It's always rate equals k times the concentration of each reactant, each raised to its own exponent. In our example, we had three reactants, but we could have had fewer reactants, or more. Notice that the exponents in our example were all integers. That's usually true. It is possible to have exponents that are fractions, or even negative numbers, but those are more complicated reactions, and we won't see those in this class. Now that we know the rate law of the reaction in our example, we can calculate k. To do that, we'll fill in the other data in this equation. To solve for k, we need to know the rate and the concentrations of the three reactants. We get those by looking at our data. We just pick one of the trials and use the data from that trial. It doesn't matter which trial we choose. All four trials would give us the same answer for k. I'll use the data from trial 1. We plug in values for the rate and each of the concentrations. Remember, any number raised to the power of 0 is equal to 1, so that's what we get for this last term. Also, notice that when we square the concentration of A, we also square the unit, so the unit for that part is m squared. Now we solve for k, and we get 1000 m to the minus 2 times s to the minus 1. That unit looks a little strange, but it works out that way because we had molars over seconds on the left side, and we divided by molars to the third power. One thing to know is that this won't always be the units we have for k. Every rate law is different, so you'll need to be careful when you calculate k in order to make sure the units in your answer are correct. Anyway, now that we know k, we can predict the rate of the reaction no matter what concentrations we start with, because k will always be the same for this reaction, as long as we keep the same temperature. Let's try an example using a real chemical reaction instead of a generic one. Suppose we combine mercury 2 chloride and an oxalate ion, which produces chloride ion, carbon dioxide, and mercury 1 chloride. Let's figure out the rate law for this reaction. We can start out by writing as much of the rate law as we can so far. Remember, a rate law always has the same basic format. We have rate equals k times the concentration of each reactant, each raised to a different exponent. In this example, our reactants are mercury 2 chloride and oxalate. The main thing we need to do is to determine the exponents, and in order to do that, we need data. So, here's some data for this reaction. If we compare the first two trials, you can see that the concentration of mercury 2 chloride changes and the oxalate stays the same. So the oxalate is our control. If we take the ratio of trial 1 to trial 2, we get a ratio of 2 for the rates and a ratio of 2 for the concentrations. 
That makes the exponent 1 for the mercury 2 chloride. To get the exponent for the oxalate, we need to compare two trials where the mercury 2 chloride is the control. So we'll compare trials 1 and 3. If we take the ratio of the rates, we get 9. And the ratio of the concentrations is 3. That means our exponent for oxalate will be 2. So that gives us our rate law. We use 1 for the exponent on mercury 2 chloride and 2 for the exponent on oxalate. Now that we know the rate law, we can also determine the value of k, the rate law constant. Just as in our earlier example, we use the data from one of our trials. We can choose any of the three trials because they'll all give us the same result for k. I'll use the data from trial 1. When we plug in the rate and the values for the concentrations, we can solve for k and get 8.73 times 10 to the minus 3, and then the units are molarity to the minus 2 times seconds to the minus 1. Again, be careful when you calculate the units for k. They won't always be the same for every reaction. Now that we know k, we can determine the rate of this reaction for any starting concentrations. For example, suppose we started with a concentration of 0 0.200 molar for both of the reactants. What would be the reaction rate? Because of all the work we just did, it'll be easy to calculate this. We use 0 0.200 molar for the concentrations and the value of k we just determined. That will give us a rate of 6.98 times 10 to the minus 5 molars per second. There's one more very important thing to know about the rate law. As we'll see in the next few videos, the exponents in the rate law are especially useful bits of information. The exponents are called the reaction order. For example, in the reaction we just looked at, we found out that the reaction is first order with respect to mercury 2 chloride, and second order with respect to oxalate. Also, if we add the exponents together, we get what's called the overall reaction order. So this reaction is third order overall. In the generic reaction we looked at earlier, we can see that the reaction is second order with respect to A, first order with respect to B, and zeroth order with respect to C. If we add the exponents, we find out that it's third order overall. So, what's so important about the reaction order? It turns out that if you know the reaction order, you can find out a lot about a reaction. That's because all reactions with the same order are a lot alike in some important ways. So, for example, all first order reactions have similar kinetic behavior, and so do all second order reactions, and so on. So, if you know the reaction order, you can make predictions about how long the reaction will take and how much product you'll have after a given amount of time. Information like that is extremely useful when you want to know whether a reaction is fast enough or slow enough to be useful, or how long it'll take for the reaction to give you the amount of product you want. For that reason, we'll spend the next few videos finding out what we can learn just by knowing the reaction order. This is a big topic, and the reaction order is something that chemists spend a lot of time finding out whenever they develop a new chemical reaction, so the ideas you're learning about here are good practical knowledge. But that's enough new material for now. In the next video, we'll start learning about first order reactions, and I hope you'll join me for that one. Until then, have a good week.